Well, hello, and welcome again to the 2012fad.com. I'll be your host for this evening, and my name is Charlie Bluehawk. Last night, we talked about television as a tool, and I think we can pretty much all agree that um, most of television is just, well, garbage. More specifically, most of television is just a way of our masters to condition and control us. We also talked about the lily wave, or the lily effect, which is a deliberate design of the television to have a flicker rate of, I believe, at 60 megahertz per second. And that flicker rate actually causes our consciousness to sort of shut down, to go into sort of a sleep-like trance, which makes us a lot more susceptible to any kind of uh, horrific programming that our masters want to do to us. And we've all seen this. You've all walked, you know, we've all walked into a room and watched people who were watching television, and they all look like they're in a trance. And you and I do the same thing when we watch television. We're just not aware of it. That's the whole point. And we've talked briefly about how we are not, you and I, one consciousness, but several consciousnesses in one body. Um, Eastern philosophy has known about this for hundreds, thousands of years. And in the West, we call them the id, the super id, and the ego. And basically that means that the three major consciousnesses, since we are Westerners as a rule, we'll stick to those. The conscious, which is you and I talking right now. The subconscious, which is our body, has its own consciousness. And the cells in our body are actually the consciousness, the memories of our ancestors, our mothers and fathers, well, back through time, a racial memory, which is, so it goes from the id, the super id, and the ego. All of that is programmable, if you know how. Not to any great extent, unless you have a very low uh, intelligence level. Then it's, well, relatively easy. I saw that in New Zealand, where for 40 years now, the best and the brightest of the New Zealand people have fled the country never to return. And when the best and the brightest of your people are gone, who does that leave behind to run the country? And of course, it leaves the morons. So I actually saw the future, if the United States had a future, which it doesn't. I saw the future of the United States when I was in New Zealand. The thing about mind control, social engineering, is no matter how good you are at what you do, people still know something's wrong. And it makes them angry. And I saw a level of rage in New Zealand I didn't think was possible. Unless, of course, you're a lab rat. And that's what the people who are left in New Zealand are. And so tonight I thought we would chat about holographic survivors. And as we've chatted about in the past, I'm, I'm trying to understand, at least for myself, what exactly is going on? Because if you remember any of the chats we've had in the past, I see repeating people. I see um, buildings appear and disappear. I see streets change. And we could chalk this up to the fact that I do drugs, but I don't do drugs. We could blame it on the fact that I am a drunk. I don't drink. Uh, <laughs> we could uh, blame it on the fact that I was beaten senseless as a child so many times that by the age of five, most of the bones in my body had been broken. Mostly that's healed. But the problem is these things still happen. So there are, as far as I know, three possibilities for you and I of what's going on in the world around us, the world we're inhabiting. And the first one, as we've talked about before, is that you and I are 19 years old. Our parents have sent us to university to get a degree in North American studies with a minor in English. And in order to accomplish this with uh, modern educational techniques, you and I go to college. We're 19 years old. And on a nice Friday afternoon, we go to uh, class. And uh, we lay on a couch, each of us. And we're strapped down for our own protection. And we are connected to a computer, which actually has a learning program. And you and I all of a sudden find ourselves being born into a new life, a new reality, inside of the computer, just like they showed us on The Matrix, the movie. 
and how we live one entire lifetime inside of a computer program where we learn North American studies, we learn the English language, or at least the American version of it. And uh, after 50, 60, 70, 100 years, we die inside of the computer program and discover that we're back at university, 19 years old, and only a couple of hours have passed. And then I guess the computer grades us to see how well we did, see if we made all the right choices, and see if we uh, get our degree in North American Studies with a minor in uh, English. We then go, uh, I guess, have lunch with our friends and our uh, parents, and uh, we get our, sir, uh, our diploma and go off to do something. Well, that's one possible scenario of what you and I have been looking at, because a computer program that complicated, basically a huge video game, obviously someone's hacked into it because all these terrible things are happening all around us, and I can't really believe that our parents would pay for us to be tortured in what to us would be a hundred years of a lifespan. So someone's hacked the program. That would explain the atrocities we see, that would explain our masters. Uh, there's got to be a better way of teaching uh, young people than to torture them. So that's one possible scenario, the learning program. The second possibility is that you and I actually do live in the real world. But the real world is a lot more complicated than we have been led to believe. We don't live in a universe. We live in a multiverse. And you and I are existing simultaneously in at least 10 different dimensions at the same time. Western scientists have finally come to admit that at least nine other dimensions coexist with ours in the same time, the same place. And that the only reason you and I need to sleep every night is because our minds, our consciousness, is divided into at least ten different segments. So you and I are living simultaneously in at least ten different realities. And segmenting the mind sort of, you know, is okay for a few hours, but your brain has to reboot every night so it can process the data that it's collected in ten different universes at ten different t at the same time. And if you don't get any sleep, your body doesn't really care, but your mind goes uh, a little bad and you go crazy. And again, there must be another outside influence beyond the fact that you and I are living in multiple realities at the same time. And you and I have talked about um, different realities, different dimensions. It's not really hard to comprehend. Every dimension has a different frequency. The atoms of your body here in this reality, for example, all of the atoms of your body, mine, the car you're driving, the house you're living in, uh, the coffee you're drinking, all the atoms in our bodies and everything around us are all vibrating at the same frequency. Let's say 100.1 on your FM radio dial. It's the same as changing the radio station. Today you're listening to rock. 100.1 on your FM radio dial. Tomorrow you feel like country western, so you change the setting on your radio to 100.2 on your FM radio dial. So now you're listening to country and uh, country and western. And that's what moving between dimensions would be like. You'd have to change the frequency that the atoms in your body vibrate at in order to see a different reality. But you could have millions, billions, trillions of different dimensions all in the same time, all in the same space, as long as they're all vibrating in a different frequency. Perhaps that's what I'm experiencing for whatever reason, or I'm just insane. When I walk out of the house, walk down the street to go to this same market I've been going to for months and I get to the end of the street and instead of the street connecting to the main boulevard now there's a park with benches and concrete sidewalks and trees and shrubs obviously been there for decades and yet I'm the only one who notices or that uh, Circuit City store that suddenly appeared in the parking lot in Silver Lake in California a suburb of Los Angeles many years ago Nobody else noticed. There weren't TV crews out front. There weren't newspaper reports. Nobody noticed. Why? Because in that particular dimension, at that particular frequency setting, there had always been a circuit city in that particular place. And the only change in the environment was me. 
Why my frequency would change? Having a clue. Makes no sense to me. Unless there is, again, an outside influence uh, experimenting with us, like we're lab rats. And I actually read reports where uh, people have seen, and I'm not sure even how to describe it, this, it's like uh, people have seen uh, trap doors open in the world around them, and a hand reaches out, grabs something out of their room, the hand retracts into this trap door, and the trap door closes, and yet the trap door is in midair. There's a um, ancient Celtic uh, belief in the bower, what they call the bow borrowers, and it's been attributed to everything from leprechauns to fairies to elves, where something in the house simply vanishes, no explanation for it, and then a little while later, that object, your keys, your uh, clock radio, your shoes, reappear in the house, but in someplace else. You know, you can attribute that to being forgetful to the kids doing something, to someone playing a joke on you, something. But it's existed through all of human history, the borrowers, in one uh, language or another. I don't know. So that's the multiverse theory, where someone really is using this as lab rats, but we're, you and I are just naturally existing in multiple realities at the same time. It's a part of nature. There is a third possibility, which frankly kind of scares me. This, the other two I could sort of kind of see and accept. Uh, the first one means that we're not really being physically harmed. We're just having our brains scrambled and having the hell beaten out of our psyches. The second possibility, the multiverse, um, well, it's nature. Not much you can do about it. Okay. The third possibility is what's been called the holographic universe, or in our case, yours and mine, the holographic survivors scenario. This is kind of scary because in the holographic universe idea, you and I are not just living inside of a computer. Our bodies are gone. You and I, the essence of what you and I are, has been reduced to, for lack of a better description, particles of light. And you and I, and everybody else for the majority, are escaping some terrible holocaust. And to survive, to preserve the essence of ourselves, you and I, and the rest of the human race, have been reduced to light particles inside of a box. And the idea is not that we evolve inside of the box. The idea is that we simply survive while this box on a ship of some kind travels from one world, obviously devastated by something, to a brand new world. And it's not educational, it's not training, it's not, it's, it's not that we have the ability to evolve. We're simply being preserved, like we've been bottled in alcohol as a specimen. The scariest way and the most deliberate way to, to look at this is go down to the local shopping mall. And every shopping mall has a store that sells holographic artwork. Let's say you go to the local mall, you spend 20 bucks, and you buy a holographic picture of a sailboat. Very typical. Pretty much anywhere in the world you can find this. Go home with your holographic picture of a sailboat. Admire it. Study it for the day, have a nap, get up the next day, take that picture of that holographic, that holographic image of the sailboat, put it into a plastic bag, and smash the picture. So now you've got a collection of glass shards inside of a plastic bag. Don't cut yourself, for goodness sake. Look now at the smallest fragment that you can handle of that broken glass. What you're going to find is even the smallest shard of glass of that holographic picture now contains the complete image of that sailboat. And no matter which way you hold it, the smallest piece of glass you can find of that broken picture contains all of the information of that 3D sailboat. 
It's all there. How is that possible? I don't know. I've heard explanations. I can't understand it. But that's what we're looking at here for you and me and the world around us. Now, again, you can go on the web and research this. You don't need me for this. Look up the description of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. DNA is the building blocks of all life on this planet, all carbon-based life. That would be you and me, your dog, your cat, your parakeet, your goldfish, uh, the red meat you had for dinner last night, uh, the carrots you're feeding your uh, goat in the afternoon. Deoxyribonucleic acid, DNA. Then look up cloning. In one cell of your body, in anybody's body, one cell of DNA contains all of the information required to make a complete duplicate, a new copy of you. That's the idea of cloning, making exact duplicates of somebody. The CIA has been working on this since uh, the key of Solomon was unlocked in the 1930s. Our master has been making clones since then. Uh, a lot of us were part of the cloning project to, to create super soldiers. Those projects thankfully failed rather miserably. I've seen uh, myself, quote unquote, uh, pictures of myself in Switzerland where I'd never been. I've had people confront me about my being in parts of Hollywood I've never been in, or in Colorado, Silver Springs, Colorado, or Sacramento, California, or uh, Smyrna, Tennessee. I said, Charlie, I just saw you uh, driving a red convertible Mustang at the convenience store. You bought a six-pack of beer. You jumped in the car and drove away. And I said, no, Paul, I've been here at work all day. That wasn't me. The point being, one cell of your body contains all of the holographic information required to make a copy of you. Let's take that one step further. Look up RNA. RNA, ribonucleic acid. Ribonucleic acid is how your body cells, how your body, the cells in your body, store memory. Now these are not just your memories, but the memories of your body, which has its own consciousness. It also stores the information, the consciousness of the cell itself, which is a complete history, a racial memory of every mother and father you've had for the last 2.5 billion years on this planet. One cell of your body contains all of the memories of you, your body, and your racial history. It's holographically stored. How is that possible? It gets a little scarier because if you and I are survivors of some terrible holocaust and our bodies have been reduced to nothing, and yet the essence of what we are has been stored inside of this box, this holographic box, our bodies are gone. You and I are traveling through space, through time, through something, to another world, a new home, escaping either a disaster or a war. If we're esca escaping a disaster, that's understandable. Escaping a war means that we have enemies, and we're escaping our enemies. So the scarier part of this story is, what if our enemies came along with us? What if the things we see as uh, little gray aliens or lizard people or whatever actually managed to get into the holographic box with us and instead of escaping our enemies, we box them in here with us? This also might account for the concept or the, or the uh, deja vu effect that I certainly experience on a daily basis. I'm sure most of you do as well. What if in preserving the essence of who we are. Whoever saved us didn't really have the opportunity or the knowledge to allow us to reincarnate, to try to make ourselves better lifetime after lifetime. What if inside of the holographic box, we're simply repeating the same program over and over and over and over again? So during the time we're locked in this box, during the 
time of our journey to a new world, a new home, we don't evolve, we don't grow, we don't learn anything new. We're simply doing the same thing over and over and over again. But each time our memories are wiped somehow, but not completely. And maybe that's what deja vu is, doing the same things that we've done a hundred times before, a thousand times before, a million times before. What if the ship is lost? Are we going to spend all of, you know, creation living the same lives over and over and over again, making the same mistakes, suffering the same pain? It's like watching your favorite uh, television show in reruns over and over and over again. It gets to the point where you can say the dialogue along with your favorite TV characters because you've seen the same episode so many times. And what if... It was all for nothing. In escaping our enemies, they're right along in here with us. I don't know. I do know that in science, in this world, whatever it is, if you take a piece of the human brain and cut it away, memories are not deleted. How is that possible? Do you know if you take a piece of your brain, a piece of material from your brain, and a piece of material from your heart, and examine them side by side, there's no difference. How is that possible? I don't know. I have no answers. I'm still, I'm still just asking questions. If you've got an idea, I'd love to hear it. Whatever world you and I live in, there were things called the Brian Laws where a very advanced people, real or imagined, which of course would include you and me, whether we're real or imagined, they had laws. And at one time we respected those laws. Those laws have since been destroyed, wiped out, erased from our history, hopefully with a thought to erase them from our, our existence as they wish to erase us, you and me. But they had a belief in fairness, and they had a belief that love was power, more powerful than hate. I'd like to believe that, personally. But they had a greeting, a prayer, a wish, a dream for friends or for beloved strangers, and I share it with you. May you live as long as you wish. May you love as long as you live. For the 2012fad.com, this is Charlie Blue. The 2012fad is brought to you by Coffee and Blood, Love Letters Between the Dead, a series of five erotica horror novels about a fallen angel finding his way back to regain his own soul, and how the CIA war against the human race their black magic captures and traps him in the body of a mind-controlled slave designed to hunt down and to kill their god, their Satan.